Yeah. Usually it's like an hour or something, and then maybe Q and A. Yeah. Are you in a rush? Oh wow, nice. Oh my god. Oh, we're going together first? Yeah, she has a really nice I was going to uh, swimming on the camera. Now we're going to the camera. Also, I'm saying, we're going to go to the camera. Oh, nice. That's very far away from our house. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's like when you go to the camera. Uh, it's about the relation between price and the price. Do I like this show? I don't like this show. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, I just ran before I got to the house. I really like it. It's like a very interesting association. Yeah, it's like a very interesting association. Sure. That would be a bit better for yeah. my recording. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, no, it's okay. Thank you so much. My name is Natalie Cook, and I'm delighted to welcome you, to welcome you here this evening. Um, before we begin, we'd like to say that our hearts go out to the Pittsburgh community. There's a vigil happening, actually, as we speak, down on Lower Campus. I'm Associate Dean of McGill Library, and I'm here with some of my team for McGill Library's ROAR unit. ROAR is an acronym for the combination of McGill's Rare Books and Special Collections, that's the R, the Oster Library for the History of Medicine, the Visual Arts Collection, and the University Archives. For nearly 200 years, McGill Libraries have been collecting, preserving, and publicizing our treasures. We do this to inform and inspire ourselves, our children, and their children, and the scholars of tomorrow, Libraries think in very long terms. But like good friends and memories, our collections are best enjoyed in the company of others. That's why we've invited you here tonight to hear about one, one treasure of the Oster collection, Andre Vesalius's The Fabric of the Human Body. Our collections are like a potluck meal. The contributions of many go to feed and nurture all of us. Over the years, our collections have grown through donations of both funds and collections, as well as financial gifts to subsidize acquisitions and restoration of materials. 
we've received menus, cookbooks, um, treasures, and manuscripts, including the working papers, for example, of Casey Wood, who collected for the Oslo Library for many years, thanks in part to a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Council of Canada, we are able to welcome today Professor Hélène Cazès to shed light on part of our robust collection. Remember back when libraries conjured ideas of books on shelves and silence? Well, as you can see here tonight, libraries of the 21st century are very much part of the community. They're places for moments of discover, discovery, collaborative knowledge building, and conservation. They are also places of conversation. We are busy and abuzz with activity and busting at the seams. So at McGill, we're embarking on an ambitious fundraising project to re-envision and revitalize our library space to better serve the needs of the future. The project is called Fiat Lux, Let There Be Light. While that project is in the works, though, I welcome you all to this space. We are making shift for the next little while as our regular space next door in the Colgate room, itself renovated as a result of a donation, is being currently housing some of the Osler collection, which is in transition after the fire this summer on July the 13th. In the display cases tonight, you can see some of the other treasures of the Osler firsthand. Some are also described in our handsome volume. We're very proud of this, it's hot off the press and it will be launched on November the 8th to showcase some of our collection. And we're also starting to produce a, um, a set of products to showcase some of our most beautiful things. Here's a set of cards. So, a few housekeeping notes. After the talk, we will have a Q&A, so please save your questions. And we will also have a light reception after the talk. So in, we invite you to stay, to discover, and to explore the materials on display. So without further ado, please let me introduce my colleague, Professor Frédéric Charbonneau from the Department of Littérature and Langue Française. Thank you very much, Lynn Cook. Dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends of the library, mesdames et messieurs, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce to you someone who is for me as much an admired colleague as a dear friend. Professor Hélène Caz was taught French literature and the humanities at the University of Victoria since 2001 and who now chairs the program of medieval studies, has been trained in France at the École Normale Supérieure and then at the Sorbonne. Hélène Caz is an agrégé of letters, classique, Lettres Classiques, Ancient Studies, and Doctor of Letters. She's primarily a specialist in humanism, but she's also become interested, among other things, in the history of the book and the 16th century printers of the Etienne family. Also the history of medical ideas and the work of Vesalius, a genius, anatomist, and doctor of the Emperor Charles V. And thanks to Sir William Osler's gift to McGill University of his precious library of ancient medical works, Bibliotheca Osleriana, we're fortunate enough to have original copies of the book of Vesalius, and I should say the books of Vesalius, since uh, besides this De Humani Corporis Fabrica Libri Septem, of which she will be lecturing today, uh, we also possess copies of the epitome, the letter on the route of China, the anatomical tables, etc. And Enkaz is well versed in all of those works, and she's been familiar with our universities and his libraries for a long time. In 2012, on the occasion of a sabbatical leave, she stayed with us at, as an Osler Fellow, and together we collaborated on a research project on the literary history of medicine, where Vesalius had a key role. She has already made dozens of scholarly contributions to the knowledge we have of these iconic Renaissance books. Past president of the Canadian Society for Renaissance Studies, Hélène's activity is incessant. Besides some 175 specialized publications, 
and 160 conference papers and scholarly lectures, which put me to shame. She has signed 18 books and journal special issues as either author or editor, either by leave you in her expert hands for this lecture on book anatomy. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for being there. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Natalie has gone, but uh, I am very uh, grateful for the, this opportunity. But also thank you to the Oslo Library for the inspiration that I found some years ago in this uh, place, well, just uh, in the other building, <laughs> close to the ashes of the great man and uh, for a great collection that keeps producing new ideas and uh, attracting uh, new scholarship. And uh, I, I first said that I would talk about the book called The Fabric of the Human Body, which is published in 1543 and is an iconic book. And then I thought, no, I'm in McGill. I'm going to talk also about William Osler. So uh, you'll have to forgive me, sometimes I'll go quickly, and sometimes I may even skip uh, through slides, because I want to get to my second part, which is, what has William Osler done to the reception of this book so that it became a, such an icon in our times? And it's now very uh, much appreciated. So first, uh, let's start with the fact that uh, Andreas Vesalius in himself is a hero for the way, in the, for the narrative we give ourselves about the history of medicine. Uh, he's born in 1514 or 1515, which is quite important for William Osler, who, who collected a lot of uh, books, uh, horoscopes, and uh, documents about that. He was born on the 31st of December, and that changed everything for the zodiacal sign, if you if were born on the 1st of January, as you can guess. But anyway, that's something between 1514 and 1515. That's a time when things and ideas are changing a lot in Europe. That's just before the break of Reformation, just after uh, the new continents were uh, explored and were sought to be discovered by Europeans. That's the beginning of the printing press. So that's a time where everything is changing. Nothing seems to be certain, sure. And the tradition is questioned in all domains. And Andreas Vesalius uh, has, thanks to Dr. Osler and to other scholars, has been the symbol for this new spirit the new uh, world of thought and science, the Renaissance, which means rebirth. He was extremely young when he published The Fabric of the Human Body. And that wasn't his first book, that was the third one, at least. So he was 28, and uh, he starts his book by saying that he's only 28, but he is doing the first real book in history of medicine for the last 14 centuries. He's not a very modest uh, person, <laughs> as you will see. And he has been actually taken as the first chapter of all modern histories of medicine, saying, yes, there was before Vesalius, and then there is Af Vesalius and modern medicine. He's called the father of anatomy, the father of, mod of modern medicine, or the reformer of anatomy. And this very special status makes him a symbol, like another symbol for Renaissance in art. And that's what I call an icon. So an icon is a, a symbol that represents more than what is signified by it. So you could say, well, this is the portrait of a young man. No, an icon symbolizes a whole culture, a whole conception of the world. And that's why it's so interesting. So is it that Mona Lisa was the best portrait ever done? Why didn't we take the lady 
with the Herman, which is beautiful too. Well, this is the st in the story of reception that I icons are chosen, and that's what I would like to follow with you. And uh, we are going to talk about this book, which symbolizes not only the first book where there is such a title page as for you, you can't count the number of people, and I think I can go there. Yeah. Here is Vesalius, and you see this is the author, the doctor, the scholar, and he touches the body. We'll talk about that later, but this maybe is why we say that the fabric of the human body is the best and first modern anatomy book. Just at, in the same, at the same time, Charles Etienne was publishing the dissection of the parts of the body with beautiful illustrations, with interesting medical uh, observations, but it doesn't have the same title page, even though it's beautiful. And I'm sure that you know the, the name of Vesalius, but the name of Etienne is not as famous. Etienne is not iconic. So, why was Vesalius the iconic one? Well, first we can say that uh, this book, which had two editions, so one is 1543, the other one is 1555, uh, is uh, published in Basel by Operinus at a time when these big changes in ideas is starting to, be, to get in print and to get recognized. At the same year, in the same town, the book of uh, Copernicus, the Nicholas Copernicus, on the revolution of the celestial bodies, which says that, states that the center of our system is not the Earth, but it is the Sun, is published. Uh, on, uh, so Copernicus is dying, and his book is published exactly the same month as Vesalius Fabric, the young man, 28, who is going to tell the world what they've been uh, waiting for for the last 14 centuries. And that's interesting because this year, 1543, is going to be a symbol for this renaissance, for the birth of scientific revolution. When we talk about paradigm shifts or about revolutions, this is the year we take. There is a book by Ernst Canguillem, uh, Ernest Canguillem on the history of science where he says that science doesn't progress like you know, a, slow, um, a slow hill. Uh, <coughs> uh, it doesn't progress like a path going up progressively, but it has gaps and jumps and peaks. And the first peak that he sees for our modern science and our modern world is 1543. Uh, also, Alexandre Coiré wrote a, a beautiful book called 1543, which is on Vesalius and Copernicus. So, we could say that, yes, for historians, it's meaningful, but it was meaningful much earlier than that, and I, uh, I took a picture, uh, a painting from a Flemish Jan Behren uh, painter, 17th century, and he's showing a, a doctor, a physician, and the physician is looking at something little pinkish, so that's not wine, that's urine, to see what to make his diagnosis, and he has a book you see on the, uh, yeah, I can show like that. He has a book here. And this book is our book. That's Vesalius. So when you want to show that you're a doctor, you have a book, the fabric, and there. Actually, this book has represented uh, the knowledge of anatomy, but also a medical humanism you know, a way of being learned, both in medicine and in culture. 
And for William Osler, it was one of the great books of the world. And uh, I'm going to go very quickly about that, but he says basically that it represents here the full flower of Renaissance. This is what I would like to explore with you. Uh, William Osler is not the only one to have admired this book, but he may be the first one to have explained why this book is so important for him and to have talked about it in many uh, writings, papers, books, uh, trying to analyze what was unique, what made this book so uh, iconic. And uh, many of the historians of medicine after him have followed suit, saying that this is the most beautiful book, this is one of the best books, and I could go like that for the whole hour, but I think you get the idea. Uh, oh yeah, there is another one, and another one. This is at the Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, my question was, okay, this book represents something for all of us, and we all find that it's absolutely beautiful. But there is a way, in, there is an attitude of ours that allows us to admire this book and to love it in a special way. If you didn't know it was Vesalius, would you have the same admiration? I'm not so sure. And how come this name is so well known when you have 700 pages? And uh, you'll see, uh, thanks to Mary Yearl, we do have behind the screen something much more interesting, which is a small exhibit of the real books and the real copies of these books. Uh, you'll see that this book is uh, really packed with Latin. Uh, how many people who find that this is one of the most beautiful books and the uh, shed of, of history of medicine had read Latin? Not so many. So what do we like? So has it changed forever our knowledge in anatomy? Actually, not. Vesalius thinks that there is cartilage in the middle of the heart. Uh, he thinks that we don't have a rutus mirabilis. He thinks that the kidneys are not filtering anything and have nothing to do with that. Uh, he, he doesn't know exactly what menstruations are, but they are kind of hemorrhoids. And uh, the only... Yeah, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the only piece of our body that wears his name is a very small uh, bone that can be found in the, in the little cups and things in the foot, that, which is called the Vesaliano. And it's not found in all, uh, in all organisms. So it's not for his knowledge of anatomy. And uh, it's very, it was very dangerous when I started to read Vesalius, who is a very good writer. I started to have very strange ideas about the human body. And, <laughs> and so don't, don't do at home what he says, because it's, it's not the way it is. Uh, so is it for the practice of medicine? Because there are great doctors like Bravas, Burav, Hermann Burav in the 18th century, or William Osler end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century, who are known because they were extremely good in consulta consultation, in diagnostic, and in therapy. But Vesalius was talking mainly to dead bodies. And his contempor contemporaries, his colleagues, used to say that they didn't want to see him in the room because they would be dead when he leaves. So, that's not for his human qualities. And that's not either for scientific discoveries, if I may say. But he brought something which is absolutely essential to modern medicine, as we know it now. He brought the idea that the body can be <coughs> represented and that it can be a beautiful sight to contemplate the body. 
So he changed the status of anatomy books that are not meant to be read and learned by rote so that on the day of the exam you can say which are the pairs of nerves, nerves in the right order and where are the seven uh, chambers of the uterus and things like that. It's a body alive and uh, we'll talk about that. He's not, he was not the first one to do it but he was helped by a wonderful artist called uh, Stephen Jan von Kalkar and maybe one part of the iconic process is that the people around the team are forgotten. Uh, the use of medical images, thanks to Vesalius, and because of these beautiful images, we think that we know the body if we can see what is inside. We know that we're really uh, expecting a baby when we see the echography and we see this little heart beating. Suddenly it becomes real. And this tumor is something white, showing white on an X-ray. And we have this relationship to the body that we know about it in a scientific way when we see it. The last thing is the teaching of medicine. And Vesalius ha has uh, made a point of repeating every third page in the 600 pages that the doctor, the future phys physician must be uh, uh, experienced in human dissection. And as you know, this is now all over the world a prerequisite for being a doctor. You need to be able to dissect a human body. So uh, the importance of these images uh, is actually reflected in the praise for Vesalius. Uh, and I'll go very quickly about that. Uh, we praise the beauty of the images, the art of the, the art of the of book, and the cultural significance. But there is a relative silence about medicine and anatomy in the reception of this book. For instance, Coiré or Canguilhem, these great historians of science, say strictly nothing about what Vesalius is doing, which part of the body he describes, how he kept the body, what was new or not new in that. So, as, uh, as Vesalius is a hero singled out for the history of medicine, the Fabrica is the masterpiece singled out, out from all Vesalius' works. And the images are singled out in this process too. Uh, my question is, uh, what in this reception was Osler, uh, which was Osler's part? So, I would posit that the fabric of an icon was done and sought by Andreas Vesalius himself. He had an individual stance which was extremely modern and uh, uh, breaking the tradition of authority, reverence, commentary, and respect for the uh, masters. He played a role, and that's why we love him, the role of a rebel youth, very insolent, sometimes rude, bad humor, bad jokes, but he looks like a teenager, and he has an incredible energy in doing that. And he becomes a hero for anatomy. Then I would look, like to look at the icons for the history of medicine, uh, looking, presenting you the Vesaliana, meaning everything relating to Vesalius. So two slides in the Oslo Library, and some of them are here. Uh, and a certain idea of science and of the scientific revolution, which is part of this cult of Vesalius. So, I've started with the portrait of the author, and this is uh, the, f the first uh, image after the title page that we see, like a signature for the preface of this big book. It's a beautiful portrait, and uh, it's been taken afterwards for all the subsequent books of Vesalius, as if it was a printer's device, except that there is no printer's device 
when it's Vesalius books. He doesn't let his printer even write uh, a little uh, letter to the reader. Uh, he's posing, and he's posing showing the dissection of the muscles of the hand, like the Dr. Tulp will be posing for Rembrandt. And these muscles are actually iconic themselves. They are very difficult to dissect and to show, but also they are the muscles with which you dissect. So it's like a self-portrait of a young man as a master anatomist. I, it's actually a posture, and uh, in the preface, it was usually a good idea to start saying, I don't deserve to write this book, and I'm very humble, but my friends asked me to publish it. I didn't want to, but here it is. Please forgive all my mistakes. And that was the common place for starting a preface, especially in medicine, saying, and I owe everything to my masters, and especially to Galen, a, med a physician of the second century of our era. And, uh, but I'm obliged to let it go, and please forgive me. So he starts with a preface to the emperor, and he doesn't say, I dedicate this to my masters. He says, well, uh, I'm amazed to see that anatomy is not taught anywhere, and when it's taught, it's badly taught. And he takes, and I'm showing you the title page of a, a book by one of his masters, Berenga Ruf by Carpi, Berenga Yuda Carpi. He says, well, if the doctor, the anatomist that I show you here, is standing and reading from the book, the good book, which is Galen, not looking at the body, and the people who cut and touch the body are from a different class, and you see that they are smaller uh, when they touch. Well, nobody does anything. And that's what he says. He calls that an infamous ritual. So the doctors, in their egregious conceit, they squawk like jackdaws from their lofty professional chairs, chair sings. As chairs, sorry, about things they have never done but only memorized from books of others, or they have seen it written down. So basically, because they haven't touched the body, they don't know anything about the body. They know from books, not from experience. And the other ones, the ones who touch the body and cut it, they are so ignorant of languages that they are unable to explain dissections to an audience and they butcher the things they are meant to demonstrate. So this division of labor is not only stupid, but it brings force and maintains ignorance. Now, you remember this title page? Here is young Vesalius, and he is, without a book, touching the body, and explaining what he sees. So it's been called the autopsy. I know only what I see myself. So I know we could say, yes, but now that's in a book, so you read the book, so, but let's forget this question for now. <laughs> and let's keep going with Vesalius. So as you see, people around Vesalius, you see here, there is a young student, and he wants to touch the body too, because they want to experience, not to learn from books, not to recite, not to repeat, but to invent each time someone sees the human body. So this stance of autopsy goes uh, with, uh, brings a lot of autobi autobiographical uh, details in the, in the book, because he's always saying, yes, I've seen that with my own eyes. Ah, oh, yes, I remember that was in Paris, that was in Padua. And he also says, and that's where I want to, to bring you, that what makes the authority of his book is that he's the same person 
as the one who looked at the body that he is now uh, de describing. And that's extremely important. He's the first one to do that. Charles Etienne is also dis dissecting body, but he doesn't say yes. And at the moment, I'm to talking to you about teeth, as he does. Well, I'm counting my own, own teeth. And guess what? I have a wisdom tooth coming out because I'm less than 28 years old. And we are back to use. Uh, and there is a formula that comes over and over several times in each page of these 600 pages. And that's on the basis of my own dissecting experience, I can say that. That goes to independence, and uh, I'm going to go very quickly through these slides. When he's in Paris to study uh, anatomy, after the third class, he says he sees that he's not going to learn anything if he lets the great professor of anatomy, Jacobus Silvius, who was really the, the best professor of his time, if he lets him dissect the body, nobody is going to see anything. So he takes the role of the dissector and he shows to his fellows how to uh, look at the body and how to uh, touch it. He leaves Paris in, 13, in 1536, so he's 22, eh? 21, 22, and uh, he's lecturing in Louvain before he's a doctor. So he's, a, he's never a student, he's already taking lead. And uh, he likes to rub it in. And several times in the preface, but also all over in the book, he says, well, if somebody criticizes me, it's, certainly it's because they are jealous, because I'm so young. And uh, there is a place where, well, that's uh, uh, after this uh, excerpt that I give you here, where he says, they must be all ashamed that they are so old and they haven't seen anything of the body. So when I was talking about insolence, that's what I meant too. Uh, he is going to insult these people to all along the book, saying, I am young. And what I see, I'm the first one to see because it's and because I can criticize Galen. I can question the world. And that's because I'm not in the posture of these windbags. Uh, he also say of, uh, of them that the people of these types, a type I want to boast in the presence of those with no experience. Uh, that they are smug pro Prometheuses, imagining that they have done the whole of their duty if they construct m a man in their own imagination. He calls them also witless architects of the human fabric. Uh, I, I will not give you all the insults, but this is how he talks about his professors. And he pictures himself as someone who couldn't learn from anyone else than himself, because the professors were so traditional and so far from the reality of the body. This hero for science likes to picture himself as an outlaw, and I'm going to go very quickly on that. When he talks about his studies, he talks mainly about crimes that he has committed because his professors were not good enough. So, for instance, he's in Paris, and he always gives names, because it's like for miracles, you know, when you tell incredible stories, you need details to make them credible. So, here the name is Matthias Terminus, he's a good friend. So, what do they do when they are in Paris? They go to the Cemetery of the Innocents, and this is not a good idea, uh, they find a a good supply of bones. <laughs> and uh, with these bones, so they, they, they cure them, they cook them, they clean them, and they put them in a big bag. And then uh, they play a game where they, they put a, 
it's a bond les yeux. How do you say that? Blindfold. They, a blindfold. And you pick a, you pick a bone, you touch it, and you have to recognize it. That's a good... And they say that, to look at the, the last uh, part, so eager to learn, we had no teachers to assist us in this aspect of medicine. <laughs> so he was obliged to rob cemeteries. Uh, then let's go to Louvain. Then that's with uh, Gemma Frisius, who is a genius in mathematics, a wonderful uh, uh, humanist too. So they want to take a walk and uh, they go in the hope of seeing some bones. Okay. So I pass you, and I go very quickly, uh, I pass on the details. They go to the gallows, and they find a skeleton, well, not a skeleton, they find a body which has been dried by the wind. So they are very pleased, and they think, well, that's too bad to leave this body get to waste like that. So they pull it down, it breaks, uh, they, they borrow a wheelbarrow, and they uh, bring it back in the dormitories of the university to boil it. <laughs> and they miss, uh, they miss an arm because, well, it had been attacked by crows and other beasts. So they go to a cemetery and they find an arm that will do. And they built a first skeleton and he's very proud of that. But then when the skeleton is done, they decide to offer it to the university and I read that, uh, so that everyone was convinced I brought it from Paris in order to avoid any suspicion of body snatching. Yeah, he just said very proudly that he was a body snatcher. Uh, the last one is even worse. Uh, he is, wherever he goes, he has crowds of eager students who want to see him dissect and want to touch him and touch the body and touch science. And uh, in Padua, uh, because they know that he lacks experience with female bodies, students bring him the body of a um, woman of ill reputation. And uh, that's something else, we can discuss that later. Uh, there, there is no honest woman or no virgin which is on the tables of dissection, according to the physicians. That's a real taboo. So anyway, uh, the students bring the, the, the girl, but she was the mistress of a priest or monk, country monk. And so there is a danger that she is recognized. So they take out a whole skin so that she's not recognized. And he tells us that. And he says, well, good, because I, they wanted to sue us for the crime of body snatching, but we were fine. She had no skin. Okay. So that's what I called also the provocations. But what made the book most famous, uh, what the book is most famous for is the so-called Visalian images. Uh, first, this images are done by a young man who died from uh, the plague, age 29, Jan von Kalkar. But for a long time, they were, uh, they were thought to be the work of Tiziano, which is nice. Some said Da Vinci, who was dead at this point, but why not? Vesalius himself, because he's such a genius. And it's only very late in the 20th century that scholars put a name on this artist. And even now, we don't say, oh, this is Van Kalkar, I recognize that. We say Vesalius. And when we say the word Vesalius, we think of the images, not of the Latin text. So I'm going to skip that because you don't want to know that he's the, reader, the writer of his own book. And you don't know, you don't want to know that he was so, such a control freak that he sent to the printer the blocks of these beautiful images, telling him exactly how they had to be done. And he didn't let the printer talk to the reader, he writes the letter to the reader saying, well, uh, all these little letters that you see there, they have to be there like that, and this is what they mean, 
and this is my book. And this is part of this personal stance we've seen. So these images were immediately revered and admired by everyone. They were copied and parroted before the book was published, which is, I think, a, re a record. So, uh, in order not to be copied, Vesalius had published, and you'll see it there, an epitome, so a summary of what would be in the Fabrica with the images of the tabulae and of the Fabrica. And, of course, uh, there was a leak. People were expecting it. And a book with images that resemble these images was published before the Fabrica. And we've put it close to the Fabrica. That's a beautiful book, too. Uh, af after 1543, everyone wants to have the same images. And it changes the convention. Uh, and I was explaining in another uh, lecture that this parroted uh, editions, these copied image, images, are not plagiarism. They are homages. So, for instance, Valverde, the first one to pirate the images and the ideas, says in the preface, Vesalius is such a genius, and I want to share with you my enthusiasm for the book which is not out yet, but which will come, the Fabrica. This is the best book ever. And I'm just giving you a short and fade uh, um, glance on, on what it could be with my own book. So uh, I show you also this 16, 17, uh, 17 uh, title page, because after Vesalius, nobody does title pages for uh, history for books of medicine like before. So they all want to show the doctor touching the table, touching the body at the center of the image and not at, in the margin, like Berengario de Carpi. And you see, they all say, say, show that they put their hands in it. They are, this is also a book known for the famous dance of the Scorched Man. And you have here a set of postcards that were done from uh, this book by a friend of Osler, and you'll find them in the little uh, exhibit there. I'll go very quickly. Uh, this is part also, this is central part of uh, the commentary on the Fabrica. And uh, these images have become ours. They symbolize anatomy and history of medicine for blogs, websites, museums, lectures. I'm going quickly. Okay. In many ways, we can say that the Oslo Library is like a temple for Vesalius. I, William Osler, at some point, had six copies of this book in his home. And he was very pleased, so he took pictures of that. <laughs> and uh, he tried to give these copies uh, to uh, faculties of medicine, because he believed that the link with books that were making, that had made history, would give a tradition to these new faculties of medicine that were starting to uh, um, uh, develop everywhere in North America. Uh, I'm going to go quickly on that, but he gave one to McGill, saying that this book is given to this faculty, not for what it says, but for what it did and what it represents. So that's exactly or iconic dimension there. And uh, he collected uh, books by Vesalius, but also all the re-editions and all the translations he could find, but also little things about Vesalius, like his horoscope, bibliography, little objects, and 
paintings. So you'll see he has uh, several paintings of romantic Vesalius, because the rebellious became the romantic hero, and he's depicted uh, like a student, a bohemian student, you know, could be in a Verdi uh, opera, uh, living in a student room and uh, dissecting with a candle alone, uh, clandestinely. So, we have 64 editions and re-editions of this book in the Oslo Library. That's absolutely huge. Uh, to give you an idea, we have 140 copies uh, in the, on WorldCat. So we can say that what Oslo did is that he made Vesalius, that was already f famous for scholars and for doctors, a famous man in Canada and in the United States that wasn't yet so distinct. Okay, so I would like to present you briefly uh, this collection. Uh, all the original editions of the works published by Vesalius, except for the tabulae at this point, were assembled. So that means that he was collecting and asking, you know, uh, booksellers, col other collectors, friends, to help him complete the collection of the works of Vesalius. Most of the reeditions, copies, pirated copies, continuations are done, but also important work of bibliography, biography, historiography, and uh, various papers, articles, photographs that he took when he visited Europe, like a skeleton assembled by Vesalius, and that was in the Vesalianum in, uh, in Basel, the painted portrait, booklets, booklets that were done for the celebrations, were collected. But I want to go a little further. He also first fostered scholarship on Vesalius. So he organized that a German, uh, a German historian of art wrote and published uh, his, a book at the Oxford Press, uh, the Oxford University Press, on the iconography of Vesalius. That's Marianne Spieler, and that's still an authority on the images of Vesalius. And he was trying to get scholars to write books about Vesalius. He tried to, re, uh, to give a re-edition of the tabulae, so the Mayan Spielmann and so on. And last but not least, he gave lectures on Vesalius to doctors, to students in medicine, and to the general public. So he wrote a lot about his love of Vesalius. So in this library, which was supposed to illustrate the history of medicine, that's what he says when he says he talks about his project. In this library, Vesalius is a hero. And uh, he is uh, the embodiment of what he calls the master world. And you'll see a pamphlet with, uh, wearing this title in the exhibit. The master world is what is key for progress for humankind. What does matter? Well, Vesalius matters because he represents the eternal use of science. To be a scientist for him is to have a useful inquiring man, mind, to dare thinking out of the box, to dare being better than your professor. And that's a talk that he used to give to students in first year of medicine. He, calls, he talks also about the Vesalian spirit, which is to question everything except what you see, and to, be, to prefer to be outlaw than to be an obedient ignorant. So Vesalius was certainly famous before Oslo, but he became a symbol, a general symbol for this culture after Oslo. So uh, 
this is a very special collection within the collections of uh, William Osler. And uh, he is very proud to say that he had so many copies that he didn't remember at which library he had already given one. And at some point he is in a panic because he cannot find a library to give the Fabrica. And uh, that's the, the, the copy which is now in Minnesota. He also had a slideshow about uh, Vesalius. He had a magic lantern, you know, like a PowerPoint, on the, which was, and the presentation was called The Evolution of Medicine. So first chapter I want to show you, this was awful. This was the times of ignorance. And so there were some big names, Hippocrates, Galen, uh, Mondino de Luzzi, but basically nothing happens and you see ugly things. And then comes Vesalius, and what does he say? He says, first, this is the same year as Copernicus. He says uh, 1542 and not 1543. I don't know why, but I can tell you that this is 1543. And, uh, and he's, he's talking about that in many other places, so with 1543 in later versions. So the idea that the world is young and belongs to young people. He talks about the images and he says, how atrocious was the anatomy of the early Middle Ages. Shows that and says that we appreciate what Vesalius did when we look at all these horrors before him. Uh, he talks about the tables and uh, I want to show you these two pictures that I really love, that are glued by William Osler in one of his books about Vesalius. That's a book by Rose Joseph Roth, and uh, that was in German. And that was the first scientific biography of uh, Vesalius, published in 1842 or 43, I can't remember. And uh, in the... In the first leaves, you know, that are left by the binder so that uh, the book stands well, he has put uh, pictures of himself and uh, Harvey Cushing, his friend and co-collector of Vesalius. And they are looking at the uh, anatomical tables of Vesalius. They had gone to Scotland to visit them and they wanted to do a re-edition, a facsimile. And he proudly, uh, proudly shows uh, their, um, their visit. That's the Stirling, uh, Stirling Maxwell copy. And it's quite documented in the archives, and I hope that some of you, inspired by the Vesalian spirit, will write master thesis about that. Uh, he shows, so he is amazed by the anatomical tables, but of course, he prefers the fabrica. And he has no, uh, absolutely no reservation in praising it and saying that this is the best book ever published. He also like, likes in Vesalius the disre disregard for authorities and for professors. And uh, he finds that this is a new way of teaching, not interactive, but a dialogue. And the professor is supposed to provoke and help the student finding his own truth. I, I'm going to go quickly about that. In the end, what is shown with this collection, within the collection, is a certain idea of history of medicine. I'm going, I'm reaching my uh, conclusion. First, the belief and the hope for, the belief in and the hope for scientific progress. That there are big chapters written by great men and that there are steps that we can build on to go further. 
that's not something we would do now in the history of medicine as such, because we don't believe anymore that we are always right when we follow what is famous and what has been passed down to us. We know that we, there is more that we don't know uh, each time we discover something we didn't know. But that's not the, the idea. There, there is a trust in the future that it will be better and better. And uh, medicine is uh, at the head of this sphere of progress. There is a belief in individual freedom, that great spirits do not, uh, do not flourish in academy because they have titles and they have doctorates. They are free of all that and they lead the other ones and they inspire them. There is also a love of books that science and knowledge come with beauty and the book is the form of this beauty. It's also linked with uh, a certain idea of friendship, that friendship makes science, makes us better. And he wrote a little uh, novel, unpublished, thankfully, because I read it, on the friendship between uh, Mikhail Servetus, who discovered actually the circulation of the blood, but was burnt at, on the stake in 1553 by his friend Calvin. This is something that we should remember often. Uh, so he wrote a book about the friendship that allowed each of them to be better. And himself, he was a very close friend to Harvey Cushing, his former student. And they both collect Vesalius, uh, his wife, Greece Osler, wrote to the wife of Cushing that she had lost the two men. They had left in the, the, they were late for dinner and they had left in the office and she calls them or two Vesalian lunatics. And this friendship was, uh, is continued after the, the death of William Osler by the biography that writes, and that's a huge biography in two tombs, written by Harvey Cushing, who was also a neurologist and a professor on his own, the life of Sir William Osler, who won the Pulitzer Prize in 1929. It's also, and that's my last word, a testimony of his support to libraries. He collected these books with the idea that it would be the Oslo Library, that his ashes and his wife's ashes would be in the center of this collection, and that was his legacy to the world, because great books, when they are put together and given to students and scholars, bring great ideas. And he keeps talking about that. He calls that also the Vesalian spirit. So, there is no mistake in this reading of Vesalius by William Osler. He's no fool there. That's exactly what Vesalius had envisioned. The praise of youth, the praise of new ideas, away from authority and with the beauty of images and beautiful, bright new books at the time. Thank you for your attention. much, Professor Kaz, for this wonderful talk. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to speak for a few minutes about, just to recap, I, I guess you've already said a lot about the Osler collections. Um, then we're going to have a question period. And then I'm going to let Professor Faith Wallace do some concluding remarks that also can help us wrap up some of the questions that have been asked. Um, and I think if I, can, if I can remember, it's a, it's a picture. Um, sorry, I should probably introduce myself. I, I'm Mary Earl, I'm the head of the OSO Library. Um, and 
I think first, it's also, it's interesting for us, as, as probably many of you know, we had a roof fire over the summer, so we're in a different location, and I think that's, that's relevant to a lot of Professor Kaz's uh, uh, invocation, I think, of, for instance, Sir William Osler's ashes, because a lot of what we talk about when we think about the library, we think about the things that he collected, and when I was sitting here, I was thinking also of many, many years ago when I used to do academic teaching, um, I taught a class on medieval devotion. And one of the things that happened when we came, of course, also as someone who spent time in libraries, I brought my classes to libraries. And one of the points that came out of that that has really hit home now that I've become the head of the Oslo Library, but that came out of that session was the importance sometimes of books not for the text that's in them, um, as was mentioned in people who might not read the text of Vesalius, but the book as an artifact. And I think in Osler you have someone who appreciates pretty much all aspects of the books. You know, he appreciates, he, he's collecting something that should represent the history of medicine as he understood it, and as, as referred to in that talk, it's a bit of a, you know, what we might call now a sort of a great man history in a way, of people building on each other and sharing ideas, but it's also something that appreciates, sometimes there's just, there's an aesthetic quality of books or of objects, and sometimes it's being near something that was done by something or someone great. Um, and so, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Ozer collection, the nucleus of our library is, is Ozer's library of about 8,000 volumes of books he collected. And even though it's the library of the history of medicine, we don't only have medical books, because we have the books that are like the ashes, the things that Osler wanted closest to him, um, and the things that you know, and he very consciously thought were important. So not just for building the history of medicine, but also for really building a whole person. And so if the key phrase that sort of sums up Osler's um, philosophy that he used was equanimitas, it's not just that medical aspect, it's not just a scientific aspect, but we have a facsimile of Shakespeare, we have, you know, he collected every edition of Thomas Brown's Religio Medici, we have works of Rabelais, we have Anatomy and Melancholy, which will go into medicine. But I think it's important to come back to what the library is, and it's not necessarily just the books in it, it's the space as designed to hold his collection. It's the proximity of his own ashes and his wife's ashes, and also, of course, Francis's ashes, to the collection itself, that sort of ever-presence of the creator. Um, and also, um, clearly, I haven't prepared my, result, my, my marks here, because what I had a few seconds ago, I've almost forgotten about. Partly, I think, is we're getting our new, our, we have more materials from the Ozil that are bought in from storage this morning, and. It's been a bit of a, a wild ride, um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, a space of reflection as well, and that, of course, is another of the really most important points of Osler himself, is that, you know, when he's criticizing professors, and he's sort of criticizing himself as well, but one of his biggest points in learning is that you can't just sit there in the classroom all the time. You can't just be reading the books either, that you have to take the time to step back and I think sometimes when we appreciate even books as something that you can look at and appreciate for the artifactual value, you also are maybe appreciating the reflection that comes as part of it. Um, I think what I'm going to do is open up the question section, session with a question that I imagine some of you might have, um, but that I... Sorry? Is it okay? <laughs> We'll wait for a minute. <laughs> um, okay, then I'm going to, before going on to that, in, in looking at the, um, the talk, I'll bring up one of the, the favorites that I like to use. We don't have it out in here, um, and I, I should say we, we do have books in here that uh, Ellen um, chose directly that are some of the, the, very, the um, editions of Vesalius as well as some other books, but one of the ones I like to show next to Vesalius is Catherine's... Um, Cascicillus Medicina. And part of the reason I like that is, is really what came out in this talk. And as anyone who's sort of seen me do this de demonstration, it's partly the anatomy scene in it that I love. Because you have a book that's printed, you know, less than 50 years or about 50 years before Vesalius, but again it has the visually hierarchical teaching of anatomy, where you have the professor in his robes who's up on the pedestal, who has the Book of Galen open. You have the demonstrator also in his robes, pointing at the body, and of course you have the workman in his just regular clothing, cutting open the body. And you have a, a series of a small number of students who really don't look terribly interested. 
And so, and it's also a fairly rudimentary woodcut, so there's also this sort of just the difference in what you have in the image. Um, but to take that and then just move to what you see in the center of the frontispiece of, of De Fabrica is, is really amazing. And you try to get people to think and realize what a change is happening in the approach to anatomy and the teaching in just that short period of time. And again, that importance that we can kind of laugh at in a way because Vesalius loves himself so much, but it is important that touching the body. Um, so, yeah. I, I could probably grab yeah. it. Yeah, and, <laughs> um, and actually I would say that he doesn't, I mean, he's not the first one to touch the body. <laughs> This Jacopo, Jacopo Berengario de Carpi that he uh, criticizes is touching the body 25 years right. earlier right. and making beautiful books. But Vesalius is iconic. Berengario de Carpi is not. So. Well, and the French's piece also allows us to, to make the point very visually. Yeah. And of course, that's part of what we do as teaching is that we continue these... Um, these stories that we might we might realize are a little bit exaggerated, but they're I think important for driving the points home. Oh. Yeah, well, that's uh, Jan van Kelka, yeah. who is the genius, it's true. because he finds the way to bring an image that we can comment and comment, and that's very convincing. Mm. But I, I I I think it's a wonderful teaching too. Right? Sorry. Mm. But uh, I think we'll just open up for questions. Yeah. We, we can also have uh, criticisms. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many of the Africa books there are still in the Austin Library? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> okay, if you say the Fabrica, and you take, so the, the, you have the two original. Uh, editions, 1543, 1555, and then you have all the copies of that were done and that are not called the Fabrica, but you have all the reeditions too. So in total, that's over 60, uh, 64. So that's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was one of the most famous books, even before it was printed. And I've put together in the little uh, room. Oh, yeah. People here. <coughs> Sorry. So I've put uh, in the room uh, on the, the. Actually, we should take down the the screen because we're done. Uh, I've put in the room the the fabrica, the first one. So you have the 1543 fabrica, and then close to it you have the first copy before it was printed, and. Close to this copy, you have the Bourave re-edition in uh, 1725. Because Bourave, who was a professor in Leiden, thought that Vesalius was such a symbol that all his works should be re, uh, reprinted. And uh, I've opened them at the same image so that you can see the difference. So I took one of the most uh, uh, elegant and sexy uh, walking men. And you'll see also how the, the, the difference, which is quite interesting, between the wooden plates and the wooden technique for engraving in the, in the Vesalius book and the copper engraving in the Brave book. That, does it answer the question? And uh, it was translated in English not so long ago. So just at the end of the 20th century, four big books by a doctor and uh, a Latinist. And then again, in uh, 2014, Daniel Garrison uh, published in Bas Basel for the 500th uh, anniversary, 500th anniversary, uh, the Fabrica, and they, they, they created a font especially for this edition. That's a, a book that comes in a plexiglass box, and in the flyer, that was in one of my slides, but I didn't have time, they say, if you love medicine and if you love culture, you must have this 
in your library. And I was thinking, yes, to whom do they send that to? To great surgeons and doctors, I believe, who, who want to be part of this iconic uh, story. It's not translated in French yet. Alors, il y a, je pense que c'est la copie que j'ai prise. Dans la, la copie du, de la Fabrica que, qui est là. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. The question was, who could afford such a great book? And actually, it's supposed to be for students. So, who can afford that? This is a masterpiece of, uh, for printing, for engraving, and it's a big book. And... Uh, One of the copies of William, bought by William Osler, is were, has inscribed the names of all the people who put their money together to buy it, which is extremely moving. So you see the sodality, so the, the fraternity of students who decided that they must have the book, and uh, you have ten names. So. Basically, that was a cooperative for a book, like we do for a library when we donate to a library because we want them to have books. That's. Daniel? Yeah, just a, a short question. Why at Okorino? In fact, I've noted that the Poles sent their uh, uh, dangerous books to Switzerland because they wanted to avoid the, the Roman Catholic uh, censorship and um, uh, led the lead to Rome to look after that. Was there something of, of this here? Because this dissection was not yet completely accepted in, in the university. Well, no, no that, that wasn't uh, the, the question. The, The plates, the, the wooden plates for the, the engravings, were already done in Venice. And I think, uh, I, I don't have a direct communication with Vesalius, but I think it was much cheaper <coughs> to send it to Operinus, who wasn't well known at the time, who accepted to be abused and insulted by Vesalius. That's absolutely amazing. And he published, he publishes, you know, at the beginning of the book, usually you had the printer saying, uh, oh, dear reader, candid reader, uh, this book is excellent, you will have, uh, you will find no, no better and wait for the next one uh, faithfully. And he says, well, instead of that, you have note of the printer, I wouldn't be able to write this note. I prefer to give you the letter that Vesalius sent to me. And the letter is so terrible. That when he keeps saying, be careful, I send you the way it should be printed. So you have the proofs. So be careful, pay attention. I don't want it to be destroyed. Uh, I don't want you to miss these gray uh, shadows. I want to have real uh, depths in there. And it's, it's absolutely awful. And, uh, and we also have two manuscript letters where, that he sent to the, the printer because it wasn't going fast enough. And he really wanted it to be done in the year. And he really abuses the poor guy, saying, not only you work badly, but you work slowly. So explain to me how you can do that both. 
and and so on. So, uh, so I think that other printers may have said no. Uh, I'm sure that, for instance, Froben would have said no. And uh, and uh, the other thing is that Operinus had started to do books uh, for students in medicine. He had published translations of Galen, things like that. So he was he was well suited, but it was also a way of not doing it in Venice. And Venice was not a question of censor, it was a question of prestige and the price he would have had to pay. I'm, I'm going to invite the discussion to carry on during the reception, which is going to immediately follow. Professor Faith Wallace is going to make a few uh, closing remarks. And thank you very much. And then come here. <laughs> it is, gives me enormous pleasure to welcome my dear friend Ellen Cass back to McGill, back to the Oster Library, even the Oster Library in exile here uh, at, uh, in, uh, in McLennan Library, um, and to uh, say a few words of appreciation and thanks to her. And I'd like to start by saying that it's a little bit ironic, isn't it, that an iconoclast becomes an icon. Uh, a man who deliberately, brashly, even uh, offensively uh, dissed his teachers and all of the great figures of the past becomes himself a great figure. And he's transformed into a great figure of the past by someone who also resisted the, the uh, conventions of his own day, namely William Osler, in the way that he taught his students. Uh, which was to teach them on the wards, to teach them by example, rather than to teach them didactically, and who in turn was transformed into an icon. Indeed, uh, a sort of secular saint who lives in the middle of his library as a kind of, uh, a kind of saint shrine. Um, I find this, this sort of uh, inversion of iconoclast and icon very interesting, and seriously rather modern as well, too. We live in a culture of celebrity, um, people who are famous for being famous, and to some extent, I guess you could say Vesalius is famous for being famous. As you point out, he contributes very little, actually, to uh, anatomy, or, uh, and even less to medicine. But, uh, but because of, of what he represents, uh, he becomes iconic. Um, and uh, there's even a, a sense of kind of memes. You know, it could be, it, it's, it's, it's very, very modern story. Vesalius, uh, his portrait, the portrait of Vesalius, the author portrait at the front, shows him dissecting the flexor digitalis muscles of the hand. That gesture of the anatomist dissecting the hand, Ellen alluded to, appears again and again and again as a kind of meme. It shows up in Rembrandt's Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. It shows up in just about every illustrated atlas of anatomy for the next 300 years. Um, why? Well, because Galen, ironically. Galen's great masterwork of philosophical anatomy on the usefulness of parts starts not with the brain or with the skeleton, but with the hand. And Galen says that it is the hand which is proof that we are rational animals, because nature endowed us as rational animals with the ideal instrument for a rational being, namely the hand. Other animals have very sort of purpose-built appendages, but the human hand can do anything. And particularly by grasping and being, you know, sort of multi-purpose, uh, uh, omnipotent, so to speak, the hand ultimately represents uh, uh, the the, uh, the rationality of the human of, of the human being. So this gesture of emphasizing the hand, and particularly the ability of the hand to close into a grasp, which is the function of the flexor digitalis muscle, becomes for Galen the ultimate image of rationality, and there's Vesalius di dissecting with his hands, using those flexor digitalis muscles to dissect the flexor, dis the flexor digitalis muscles, and we come into a kind of mise en abîme here, which is very much like how you make an iconoclast into an icon. 
But I want to say, and this is a homage to Hélène herself, that this is what humanism really means. It is, as the Danish, modern Danish wit and um, poet Pete Hines said, you conquer the present suspiciously fast if you smell of the future and stink of the past. Um, but, and, and this is, I think, one of Osler's uh, achievements as well, too. But it, in its slightly um, uh, uh, quirky way, sums up what humanism really means. It is to bring the past into the future in the present moment. It is uh, to, uh, to contact the achievements and the, uh, the world of the past and to project it not just into the present, but to show its value for the future. And Hélène is not only a student of humanism, she is a humanist herself. And I think her talk this evening has uh, embodied for us what the real values of humanism are. And it's a pleasure to once again thank you. Please join me in thanking Hélène Kaz for this wonderful talk. Mm -hmm.